camera soon. Remember, all of you, if you're playing solitaire stuff, you'll get called on the video. All right? Just a warning. Anybody ever have a class in here before? The uh, Municipal County and OG was in my class. If you ever sat here in the back, none of you ever did that. But I was in the back left corner, okay? So I could do all my work and feel like I was paying attention. I didn't say that. This is Shane's class, I think. I played so I was really all over it. No, those cameras, that's a camera right there, and I can see that thing move during the classes. Really? That was ear, eerie me. Yeah, I saw it maybe three times throughout the whole thing. And then I asked yeah, part of the class. I don't think he was recording. I think that was wrong. No, I don't, I, don't, I don't have the password that. It was great. But when I saw that, though, I, I heard they started asking us to close our laptops during the sessions. And uh, somebody said that they saw half the class playing solitaire during the, the class, so, which I understand. I don't think he can get you in that back corner. Yeah, uh, that's why I sat there. Take a little off hand. I'll do it. <laughs> oh, well, uh, my name's Jason Whitaker. I'm here to welcome everybody today. This is our second regional meeting. So our first was in Charlotte, what, a month ago or so? Mark Selenbacher is our membership committee chair, and he's done a good job with this. This kind of came out of a, an idea that uh, Terry Bledsoe had, a, a past president uh, of Nicola Jesus, and um, he really wanted to get people locally together. I know that some of me, I know Joel's got some guys, he meets with some fellow CIOs and such locally to him, they meet and have lunch once in a while. We thought, well, and, and others do that as well, we thought it would be good to have regional set meetings where we come, we have good training. Yeah, although Shannon and Maurice are great teachers, you're probably going to learn a lot from each other while you're here, too. I learned a lot just hanging out with, with these guys. You know, Grace full of knowledge. I learned all kinds of stuff. He's going to teach me how to turkey you know, for days. I mean, he didn't even know that yet. Um, but you learn a lot from each other as well. So these are really valuable sessions that we hope that everybody will take advantage of. We call them regional because you know our conferences are kind of eastern and now we're at Congress, we're going to be kind of building the state. And so we want to try to reach all the different areas. The next regional meeting, Eric, if I'm wrong, tell me, is going to be in Dare County. And all the details haven't been finalized yet on the date exactly. Maybe, I guess we do know where it's going to be. But Friday the 26th of July. Friday the 26th of July. There you go. That's not a bad time. Uh, <laughs> 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 Somebody say how to make it. That's president, I'll probably have to go to Who it. wants to teach? <laughs> <laughs> I've got some of my computer. Um, so yeah, um, we're looking forward to that one as well. But uh, I just I was gonna brag on Terry, but uh, Susan said she does everything for Terry, makes him look good, so I can brag on Terry. Um, Talbot County. But the, the idea goes back to them and kind of a, a thought and dream they had and, and we finally got a little speed going and we and we're implementing it. So we're doing a lot of new things this year. And I hope you like this. And if you have any ideas, feedback about this, please email anybody on the board. Email me. We'd really like to hear from you. I think we did a survey. Did we do a survey after the last meeting? I know we talked about one. So hopefully you'll get an email with a survey link in there and you can give us your thoughts on today's session. So I'm sorry for those that participated in the Giga Awards last week, but I got something I'm going to share that's funny about the name, Nick and Tisa. I'm going to probably tell it. Because it gets funnier the more I think about it. Um, <laughs> who's, uh, I could probably do an hour on the name, Nick and Jesus. I've got enough information. So, um, who, who has never been to a Nick and Jesus event before? This is your very first time. What's your name? Pam. Pam. From Durham? Well, can you tell me what, can you pronounce Nick and Jesus? Can you say that? Can you tell me what it stands for? I don't, I'm sorry if I'm embarrassed. You don't worry about it because there's plenty in here that will probably not know exactly what it stands for. Got half of North Carolina local government <coughs> information system. I should ask Joel. I think he would find something. It's right. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> See, you didn't even realize that. Um, so it's, it's, the group is so unique and so wonderful. But I wanted to share the, the name. Um, I don't know. Sometimes I feel really dumb. And Shannon was in Chicago. She didn't remember. I was in the audience in a class she was teaching. She talked about something. I'm not sure what you how it is. When you fear of 
not being smart or figuring out the wrong Imposter list. syndrome. Imposter syndrome. So I took some notes. I've been thinking about that. <coughs> I mean, I, I'm we definitely, also I'm a big candidate of that because I just feel like I'm just an idiot most of the time, especially the older. I just turned 40 and I've got allergies and had that knee surgery and I'm all kinds of mess going on. So, um, <laughs> it's all so, down now. I actually woke up early the other day. That, that never happened to me. Um, but the name of Jesus, if you run anybody, you can say, y'all want to make Jesus look at you like, are you sick? I mean, what, what is the name of Jesus? I've heard, what, Nickel Jesus? I think Earl Patton did that one. Um, Jemus, our international group, our parent group to Nickel Jesus, met with their board a few weeks ago. Gary, what they call it? They call it Nickel G. Yeah. <laughs> one of them couldn't figure out anything to say to Nickel G. And, uh, and that's kind of rung a bell when we tell us thinking about all the different things people say. But um, my wife, she's pretty smart. And she, she's an x-ray technician at the hospital. So she's in the medical field. She hears these big terms. A lot of times that bothers me. You ever, you ever pretend like you know what somebody's saying? And they come out a big word all the time? Okay, I'm not alone. A lot of times I'm like, wow. You know, I don't have a clue what they just told me. But my wife said something about eating right. And, uh, you know, when you have a body like this, you have to eat right all the time. And uh, she was talking about cruciferous plants. Anybody know what that means? I pretended like I knew what it means, but it really offended me that I was like, this is a plant. So she said that, and I was like, yeah, that sounds interesting. And I got up and walked out the room. And uh, I went and thought for a second. I went and looked it up, and it's actually some kind of vegetable, like a, a green cauliflower, leafy plants that have no barn, basically, that kind of thing. In my clothes. So I went back in, and I said, well, I've been invited to speak at the uh, SOG tomorrow for a giga event on behalf of Nickel Jesus. And I walked out of the room. <laughs> I thought I was special. She was like, what? I still have to tell her what Nickel Jesus means from time to time. She said, is that group the channel? I said, yeah, that's the group the channel. So you may have heard from the CIO class. So Chan's going around the world. I said, no. You ran into my boss at a bar. At a bar <laughs>
Yeah, this car, oh, okay. We'll be lucky to get out of it. Actually, it's supposed to run. It's supposed to actually, I don't know where they're going to put it, and how they're going to drive it in, and maybe we should check on the insurance, because who knows in the evening that where that car is going to run. So, um, hope I didn't give anybody any ideas. All right, let's see. I got a, a few random things here I was supposed to mention. We have an SQL 2012 class coming up in Wilmington. What's the date? So, man, anybody know? Yeah. It's coming up in April. We do have some open slots, so if you're interested or know anybody, I mean, it's a bargain. Uh, what is it, 700 bucks, 800 bucks this time? 800? And the, the class would normally cost you 1,700 to 2,000 bucks, so we buy down part of the class. It's good training. We've had really good success. This will be our fourth class. Uh, I say this year, it's budget year, of course. And then up on the screen, you see there's a schedule of we have 15 classes. I don't think all 15 are up there, but over this next year, we're trying to budget and prepare for 15 more classes. And we, we spend a lot of money, good spend money, on buying down these classes. We work with the group on the best trainers. As we told them, at any time, if the trainer doesn't work out, we're done. We can find somebody else to teach us. And uh, so once we put all that on paper and work with them, we've had some great results. So um, we put this out early. And some of these can change. We're not sure about all the dates uh, just yet and, and all the locations, but we've kind of got a plan out because you need to budget for it. We know my budget's due in the next, in the next week. Some of you have already had those your budget's due. Um, so we try to plan ahead so you can say, ah, they're offering some good, cheaper training. Let's think ahead. Let's budget for it. Maybe you can get it through and say it's new for Jesus. Support it, sponsor it. Maybe that will help as well. So go to the website. Look that up. I think Chris sent out an email about that as well. Um, I think I've covered everything that I was supposed to cover. Um, Eric, come on up. I want to thank Eric. Let's give Eric a hand for giving this out. Saw him last night printing out the badges. I think he only messed up one, right? So far. <laughs> so far. And so I wanted to thank him personally for, for his involvement here. And he's going to introduce. I'm not that she needs an introduction. Just a few words. I appreciate everybody coming out today. I know some of you had to travel a little bit far away, but one of the biggest things we're trying to do with Info Jesus is bring our conferences to you. So if you feel like you're uh, motivated to maybe host in the future a uh, regional meeting, by all means come and speak to us. We'd love to um, hear some of your thoughts and ideas on doing that. If you want to keep it a little bit smaller, maybe just a meeting, a uh, smaller group instead of capping out at 50, maybe 10 to 15, you can arrange that as well. We'd love to work with you on that. Um, also, to echo much of what Jason has said, um, Terry Bledsoe planted a seed a long time ago, and all we're doing is trying to grow Equal Jesus from a regional uh, perspective and uh, bring Equal Jesus to it once again. Um, Mark Slayton Barker could not be here today. He was there at the Charlotte meeting. That was a very successful event. It was fun. We had a great time. And I think we will today as well, due to the weather and other circumstances. It looks like not everybody can make it this morning, but that's fine. Um, just a little few little things about housekeeping. We do have bathrooms out to um, near the stairs here to my right. There's some drinks out there and whatnot. We're going to go today from um, uh, about now up until 12 o'clock with uh, Ms. Shannon here, and then we'll turn around and have lunch from 11 to 12. And then from 12 to 1, Maurice will be here uh, and uh, share a little bit with you about the YRD. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Ms. Shannon here. This is Ms. Shannon Tufts. She works here at the School of Government. Um, I've actually attended her CIO course in 2009. Excellent. If you haven't had an opportunity, you might want to put that on the radar, especially for budget time and training opportunities. Uh, it's priceless. We, we'll gain much from it and a lot of networking and friendships. Um, Ms. Shannon is going to be teaching this morning about project management, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to her. You all will just uh, give her a round of applause. Chiefs and 
then IT professionals. So it will be interesting. I'm in the middle of trying to write the presentation for the SBI that's going to deliver the presentation. questions before we get started on other things that you're wrestling with? Or the credit for or something. And so the newspaper 
where some blogger is apparently going after corruption in government saying that somehow this is a corrupt, eight, get like $8,000 but it's this whole process, and they've asked for every MAC address that has accessed the free downtown Wi-Fi, which is personal, right? Like that's your personal, not governmental, like ci like citizens or visitors to the community. Um, we are working on trying to write it so that that can be protected in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, I guess they did. So that's, that's yeah, that's the bottom line. If you don't keep it, you don't have to produce it. There you go. <laughs> I'm not saying to skirt the public records law. That's <laughs> okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about project management or agile project management. I've done some sessions on this before. I tried to change it up. We'll see how well I did at changing it up. If we get more, I can always go back to the one that I've done a million times over and talk through that. But how many of you have had a project fail? If you're not in IT, if you don't raise your hand, right? <laughs> Hate it. It's not wanted. 
So I'm going to talk about the school of government, and I'm hoping Brad can edit some of this just for a brief second. How many of you think that this would be a phenomenal idea? Now, I, I, it's very possible that I missed the faculty meeting when this may have been discussed. And so if I did, I apologize in advance for making fun of something that I should have known about. But I come to work, I'm a faculty member. And I'm sitting in my office and I'm doing my thing. <coughs> and every day or every week, I have to, at the end of all of that, produce in this automated system, which by the way, by automated I mean it's fields that drop down and then I select all of the work that I did. So basically I'm creating a billable hour model for myself, right? So that the faculty knows exactly how they spent their time most days. Does that sound like a good idea to you? Who in here would enjoy that? Right? This, this is an insane idea. But apparently our boss, the dean, wants us to have this kind of data, right, Rob? Well, what, you were here, you know? Yes. He wants us to have this kind of data. He wants this data capture. There's a reason, because they need to be able to produce reports that say what we do so that the General Assembly will fund us at appropriate levels. I understand the reason. This project, according to everybody that I've talked to in IT, is on time, on budget, on schedule, everything is running smoothly. Guess who doesn't know about it? Guess what project is going to fail massively? This one. Because the users of the system have not even been informed about the system. I don't even think that they've been asked to help spec requirements. And maybe I'm wrong, but nobody's ever talked to me about it. Maybe they talked about the fact the meeting that I missed, but regardless, I know that most of them have no idea this is coming down. And so I'm sitting in my office yesterday, and I actually said this to somebody who was talking about what a great thing this was, and I said, that's fine if you think it's a great thing. But at the end of the day, let me assure you, there's only so many hours I'm willing to spend doing my job, and I feel like I do a lot more hours than I'm already supposed to. So what you're telling me is I've got to reduce the amount of service I provide to my customers so that I can fill out silly reports so that you can produce them for the General Assembly. That's insane, right? So they're going to have some challenges. I think, unless they change, and maybe they'll socialize it the right way, I don't know. The other thing you should know is that um, although we have a boss that's called the dean, if a faculty member is tenured, which is not me, which is probably why I should not be saying this and being recorded, um, they don't have to do anything. They're protected. Right? So when you've got three quarters of your faculty and they're protected, it's pretty hard for the dean to make somebody do something if they don't want to do it. So it would be a very interesting project to watch roll out. Okay. Other things that you've done like that. Anybody here done that? Anybody here done an IT project for the business unit that was driven solely by IT? Not that you went to bed, right? Do y'all move icons on desktops? Never, ever, for any reason. It's the most horrible thing you could possibly do. It's interesting. So the reason that we, uh, we're going to talk about agile project management is because it does give us a little bit of a roadmap at some level to really help think about how we can do this better. So we're going to kind of go through the introduction, project inception, what are the sort of fundamentals and team practices, building this plan, and we'll go through some of these items, what are the iteration mechanics of it, then tracking, and then the wrap up itself. Because all of our projects will end if we're using agile development. How many of you have ever done a class on agile programming? Has anybody done that? Because it's a very similar concept, so if you've ever done agile programming classes, then you would understand it. Kind of, or Scrum, you here done Scrum? Same concept. Okay, so we come on board with the inception deck, and the inception deck is a little bit interesting. Um, so what we're trying to do is we bring everybody together, and we decide how we're going to talk about this. At, at some level, I feel like this is the Sieges project, but we're doing it way too late in the game. Right? It should have been the day they decided, two, three years ago, exactly. Two, three years ago, we should have been talking about this siege stuff, not us, but the FBI should have been socializing it with everybody that needed to be involved. So it's designed, this inception deck uh, party, let's call it a party, it's not really a party, but I'm going to tell you it's a party for right now, is designed to eliminate confusion about what the project is actually about. And that's really important because everything around Agile is around transparency. 
you know it's big in your government right now, well, it's also big in a project management sort of standpoint. The goal is to shine sort of the spotlight on areas where people might be freaking out. I keep, I'm going to keep referring back to this idea of this sort of faculty tracking system. And the first area of freaking out, what's the first thing that you can think of? I don't care if it's a faculty or a non-faculty, it's your world. What's the number one thing you think people are going to freak out about in terms of challenges or mismanagement or misalignment? Okay, so change resistance is part of it. I think I think that's part of it, but I don't know that that's all of it. Workload. I think it's a workload capacity issue. I think most people ask why. Yeah, I think that that's a really important question, which is, what's the purpose, right? How does it further our mission? And that's where I keep coming back to in my head. That's why I'm so stuck on this particular project. Is what does it do to further our mission? For me to be tracking against Bell. For me to be tracking this stuff. And I kind of I come back to this with the town of Cary at times. They've got a very interesting citizen advisory group that's around technology. And they they come up with really interesting ideas. But at the end of the day, if the idea means that you're going to take IT time away from supporting 911 services or upgrading and maintaining the email system or just provisioning basic services to those folks that are going out in the field for any number of reasons, maybe spending your time building a crowdsourcing solution to raise money for parks is not the best staff investment. And, and I say that, we're actually going to have a panel on that very concept at the Nickel Giza um, Spring Seminar because that's something we're seeing a lot of from elected officials is this push around these ideas. But we always have to come back to this question of well, how is this going to further our mission? So we're casting this spotlight on this conflict and misalignment. To me, that's the biggest challenge is this misalignment with what we say we want to do, which is help encourage good government, and what we actually spend our time doing, which is now counting how I spend my hours. And then what does it do? What kind of system is that set up from a performance standpoint? Who's going to get rewarded theoretically? I realize it's not the way it's going to roll out, but the impression could be theoretically that I will get rewarded the more stuff that I track, right? The more busy work that I do. And we actually have done this um, with our program managers. We just had this spreadsheet that they had to fill out to show how they spent their time. I think you guys in IT had to fill out a spreadsheet that showed how you spent your time. Didn't we you? do. And I was going to add, there's one other point to this that's to that is that they don't know what the point of this is. Like, yeah. The, the, um, the dean and everyone doesn't know what they want the report to look like. So because they don't have a clear of what the output's going to be, they're making you all track like everything because they don't know what they actually want to focus on, which in theory makes the, the system more cumbersome. Because you're, I mean, you're tracking phone calls, you're tracking emails, and that kind of... You're going to see Janet tracking right out of his job. But, but I mean, that's... <laughs> But I mean, we do have the same issue with I mean, over-tracking it, stuff. Yeah, it's over-tracking. Who cares about the data, right? The data doesn't tell me anything. It doesn't tell me if, you're, if I'm good at my job, if I've been effective as an instructor, if I'm effectively delivering garbage collection services. Right? All it tells me is raw data that can be manipulated. I will say, you know, I know when we did some projects like that, uh, there was a fear of transparency because now
discussion that we're having. And we're not the only ones having this. I mean, I think we're seeing this all over government. I know Nancy has worked on some of this exact concept in Winston-Salem, right? We've been able to track down to the employee level around performance. And what has that done to employee morale? Oh, I mean, I, they probably hate that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, ABL. ABL was this before, right? <laughs> now we like ABL. But I have, since I took over administration with this monster, um, we have simplified it greatly because I'm really the only one that takes any information out of that, and I just use it for um, budget charge right. rates. And I'm not going to charge down to that level. So I roll all that crap up, you know, and it's like, you know, and, and I roll like multiple applications because it doesn't really matter whether, like in our case, um, it, it didn't matter whether you were working on a report for building inspections, whether you're working on the, the piece that, that emailed out newsletters, or this, you're working on freaking building inspections, you know? Right. And just ballpark the stuff because I don't really care because I'm going to, by the time I get all this data and roll it up, into, some, into this, you know, one pager kind of thing that anybody that says they want this data is going to even look at. Mm -hmm. I don't need that detail. Right. So you know, I I cut these things down from where you know they had 50 different things to pick from every week um, to maybe 10 or 15. Yeah, and I think that's really important. Like this idea, and you didn't say it, but you kind of said it, which was the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you have them do to you. Would you want to live in this environment? And that's what I said to somebody that was in my office yesterday. I said, why did it not get built to integrate with Outlook so that it would just pull the data from my Outlook calendar and then populate the database? I know Outlook can do that. Just a simple CSV file at least, right? But that's not the, the way that it's really been thought about. Now, it means I need to manage my calendar better, but that's fine. That's a lot easier than every week or every day or every... By the way, we also do this annually. We have to do an annual report that is for every hour that we spend for the entire year on a variety of things. Great. In the previous world in the private sector, we saw this happen twice, and it keyed off of when there, were, there was a key person up change in some sort of management level. We were a geographical first group. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's, it's a really interesting area to be thinking about, and it's just a great project to talk about as we go through this agile discussion. It's not the only project we'll talk about. But the purpose of being of this inception deck is to socialize the idea. How many of you do that? How many of you have a team meeting before you roll out a project with your customers? Not necessarily a team meeting, but a face-to-face. Face-to-face. Right. And I know you're not talking at them, you're talking with them to find out what they need. And not always all customers, but we'll have users or or right. and like that. So. And, and I'm not, y'all y'all know me long enough to argue with me, but I always say there's no such thing as an IT project, there's business projects and technology solutions. I don't believe that IT should be driving any projects. I understand. Network upgrades, refreshes. I mean, like, yeah, there's some basic, like, your maintenance infrastructure stuff you truly own. I get that. But you should not be the one who's deciding that police need new software. CGIS, PCI compliance, HIPAA. Can we go online? <laughs> right? Like, all of those are not IT efforts, but the fact that they have IT somewhere in the discussion means that it gets sort of punted to the IT department. Public records law. Right, how many of you are now lawyers on public records law? Okay, so part one in the inception deck uh, process is you're going to remind yourself why you're actually there. And these are some examples of folks that actually do a pretty good job. You've got to figure out what the project's about, what your organization stands for, and why this work is needing to be done, right? It's related to them getting paid, staying on the payroll. So you've got to have that kind of conversation of reminding yourself why you're going to do this project. Then we keep moving on, um, and, and I think that this is really a problem, actually, let me stop here. Most people don't know why 
they're having to make changes. I love, I, I tell the story on Bill Stice all the time, and we all know that Bill Stice is like, you know, a wonderful IT director, superstar, but they did a voicemail switchover in 2006. The reason I remember the day, the year, is because I was in the middle of writing a strategic plan for them, and I was doing customer satisfaction <coughs> surveys, and nothing will destroy customer satisfaction survey results like changing a voicemail system, especially in 2006. Right, where it's a little bit more cumbersome. And so they did this change, and the, the problem that they had is they never told people why they were making the change. They just informed them that we're buying a new voicemail system and we're rolling it out. And oh, by the way, we're gonna roll it out over the holidays when you're not here, because it's the easiest time for us to work. Except that when people came back to work, they could not figure out how to get their voicemails. Has anybody ever done this? And they complained about that? <laughs> no, they complained about it, and then, and, and in an effort to do the right thing, IT did documentation on how to use a new voicemail system. Who in here is a good writer? Like, you feel like you're a good writer? Yeah, like, and you're probably a good technical writer is typically what I, when I say a good writer, most people say, oh, I'm a good technical writer, yeah. So they wrote 17 pages on how to use a new voicemail system. You needed like a cheat sheet, right? But they had pictures. No, I don't think you did. I think it's almost all narrated, actually. Like, it was a very detailed document. I think I still have a copy of it somewhere. And, you know, that was part of the challenge. Why was the project needed? Number one, the project was needed. And what they should have done, and I will not talk about this. He doesn't talk about it in class. But what they should have done is told people that their voicemail system was no longer supported and it was going to die, and they had to make a change or else there would be no voicemail, right? So you have to socialize the idea. Some of you have had our class before, um, the, the Seattle School, and I use something called the Ad Card Beat It model. Does anybody remember this? And you get extra ground and points if you can tell them what it stands for. Tom's in class now, you gotta remember it. Yeah, you talked about that, yeah. Oh, I talked about it. Well, you might get it, might get it in two weeks. Um, yeah, that was a good dodge. Very well done. Ad Card. That's, that's how I remember it. They don't actually, I think they call it the ad car model. And so what they talk about is that in order for something to be successful, for change to actually be implemented successfully, that you have to walk through this process. The A is creating awareness. And it's creating awareness of the business need or opportunity or challenge, whatever it is. So it's the socializing of the idea. You create awareness first. Then you have to create desire. I think some of you will remember last year we did this with Diet Coke. Remember when I stopped drinking Diet Coke for all the month because I read that it made you uh, gain weight? Remember when I did this? And I told the class about it, and then they all went and got soda. They all went and got their drinks, and none of them got soda. They all got water. The whole class got water. It was a very interesting social science experiment. So you've got to create awareness, and then people have to desire the change for themselves. Once they start desiring that change, that's when you get into the design phase. This is agile, it just isn't called that. Um, so you do desire the change for yourself, that's when you start designing how you're gonna make the change. Then, where I think we try to do a good job is we have to then give people knowledge and ability to be successful, and you start that process prior to implementation, all the way through implementation, that knowledge and ability creation here, which means training, Documentation, information, overtraining, information radiators, which are really hot topics in the agile world. And then ultimately, we come down to the R, and this is where we fail miserably. And this is why you guys fight with your various departments. Because you have to have reinforcement. We know that during post implementation, knowledge and ability will fail. It's human nature. You're going to default back to the same way you've done things. You, you know that, right? And so you have to give them reinforcement when knowledge and ability fails so that they don't feel like an imposter, right? Or so they don't feel stupid. Or so, and how do you do that reinforcement? It may be an IT person that is your lead who can help them. It may be pretty screenshots. It may be hiring your trainer to come back in instead of doing all the training at the time you do implementation. If they don't write reports until the end of the budget season using the new software, you don't train them on how to write the report nine months prior to that. I can't remember what I did yesterday. Did we talk about that earlier? That's why you're not 
business unit because that department head that tells you that I've got this problem and this problem and this problem. Everybody thinks IT can solve all problems, right? I do not envy the IT department's jobs at all in some ways. But they want to be able to track a customer, meaning you, across the life of your interaction with the School of Government, regardless of if you change locations. We do not have a database that allows us to do that right now. That is not the way it's designed, right? Because what, how would we do that? By the way, the way that we do it is you have a first and last name, and those are your unique identifiers, which is not proper database design, I realize. That's why it's hard on you sometimes to register for courses. Um, but it is interesting. I would need some sort of social security type number that you would have to remember, and it would track you. Now, the next idea is what? Email, but that's not going to track you over the course of your lifetime because y'all love to change email domains. By the way, that's Shannon's rant because I manage your listserv and I have to constantly deal with it. Um, then there's no way other than individually to replace them all. Okay, what else? What else could we do? What's, I mean, this, there is a solution to tracking a customer over their lifetime. What is it? Some sort of unique identification. Integrate it with Facebook. Oh, um, <laughs> Facebook or uh, your Yahoo login or your in, your Twitter login. You know that new sort of integrated login system. What's the problem with that? That's your personal information and it's your personal credit card, right? So we don't want your Amazon account. There is no way to really solve this problem unless we throw a substantial amount of money at it. And they're trying to solve this problem from two different directions without actually ever talking to each other about what's the priority. And until somebody's willing to set the priority, everybody's going to fail. And I've said that to both parties involved, even to the dean. Figure out what your priorities are and then work from there. But it is hard to have that conversation. And, and it really requires strong leadership. I mean, if you don't get what you need from the departments and they're not willing to give it to you and your boss isn't willing to force them to do it, meaning city manager, county manager, you're not going to be successful, not truly successful, right? You'll, I mean, you'll get by, but you're not going to be truly successful. Then we're going to create an elevator pitch, and we're going to spend a lot of time talking about selling, which I feel like I teach all the time. Although I learned um, last week, when I was teaching the class I taught last week, you would know that the elevator pitch is dead. Did you guys know this? If you have time and enjoy reading, there's a, a new book out by Daniel Pink. It's called To Sell as Human. I quite like it. I wish I would have written it. Um, and I've been, I've integrated some of his work into what we were doing in class for selling, but most of it we had already been talking about, which is a relationship, all this stuff. But he now says there's six different kinds of pitches. There's the one word pitch, which is Obama's hope or forward, right? That one word that sort of drives through every single campaign that he ever did. Um, there is the Twitter pitch, 140 characters or less. So now you've got. Think about it, you've got six seconds on TV to get your message across. That's what they tell you you have, six seconds on TV. So the elevator pitch sounds like a good idea, but you're not going to get time to deliver a true elevator pitch. We require our students here, people always think that UNC is a little crazy with our graduate students, because we make them write a capstone paper instead of a thesis. They do the work of a thesis, so it's a 30 to 40 page paper, and they have to produce a five page paper to graduate for 40 pages or 60 pages. We've got to distill it down to five pages that a manager could read and understand without all the gobbledygook academic stuff. Right? And it, I mean, I don't know, Daryl had to deliver it. <laughs> I mean, it's an interesting exercise to learn. So if you're creating an elevator pitch, this is the way that you sort of start conception like that. Four, who's the target customer that we're serving? It's not IT, it's never IT, right? This is you serving them. Who? The statement of the need or opportunity that exists. B is the product name. Um, it is A, and that's the category, and then it's going to do this thing, the reason that you're going to buy it, the compelling reason you're going to buy it, unlike whatever its alternative is, and then you're going to produce this statement of why this is going to make a difference, what's the differentiation. So this is a couple of examples that I've grabbed from the web. Silicon Graphics, they're designing, uh, their product is for post-production film engineers who are dissatisfied with the limitations of traditional film editors. Um, B is the SGI workstation, I guess they did up there, and it's a, film a digital film editor that lets you modify film images any way you would like, unlike workstations from Sun, HP, or IBM, 
and our product has all of the interfaces needed for post-production film editing. That's a sales pitch, right? So a lot of agile, it's interesting, I feel like we keep coming back to selling, like I feel like I never get out of the selling realm, but we keep coming back over and over and over to selling. Same thing, quick, and here's another example, and I'll send this out, you guys can have copies of this. Um, but you've got to figure out what is unique about what you're going to do that allows them to do something differently about their jobs. So we're going to talk about creating serial box or magazine cover. How many of you love magazine covers, right? Like y'all, some of y'all know me quite well, and you know that I buy every In Touch Weekly or you know whatever that has Snooki on the front or any of those other celebrities. I'm quite interested in, in their lives for some unknown reason. But they hook you. How do they hook you? What's the first thing you say? Okay, don't say the girl. Oh, well, I know, I know. I know you say the girl. Okay, and she's attractive. Maybe, I don't know what the lesson is there, but you want somebody who looks the part of whatever it is that you're selling, right? And somebody who can actually speak intelligently and not freak out in front of an audience. So there's that. Seriously, that's Shania Twain? Wow. I mean, she's attractive, but she's a lot older than that. Okay, that really confused me for a second. Okay, so there's uh, Shania Twain. But what else do you notice on you? Why would you buy this magazine? So, according to the headline, you're going to like her about that. You're going to make up for your body, and you're going to have, apparently, an excellent home life. <laughs> I mean, right? Like, the two things that sell. It's actually all of it is the same thing that sells. But it's a really interesting idea. They show you benefits. They don't actually talk about most of the content in there. They give you snippets. Same thing happens when we think about car sales. So if you're thinking about a car, what are features? Features are things like the horsepower for the engine, the fact that you have any lock brakes, the fact that you have cruise control. Nobody cares. What you do care about is that you can pass people safely on a highway or beat somebody in a race. I don't know how, I don't know anything about engines, so that's a lot or a little, but whatever. That you can brake safely and keep your kid safe. That's why we care about anti-locking brakes. Because I don't know about you, but I remember not anti-locking brakes where your mom would throw your hand over you, right, to keep you in the seat. Well, maybe that was before seat belts, too. Um, I still throw an arm every now and again, I can tell you. <laughs> and cruise control, you can save money by gas efficiency, right, not going up and down. Those are the benefits. When they sell cars, they sell them based on benefits. They might not say it this way, but they do not sell them based on features. You have to drill down to find the features. How many of you have downloaded an app lately? Have you noticed the way that they describe the apps? It's all about the benefits and very little about the features, and then you have to click on that read more to get the actual details of the features. Like when I'm trying to compare something and I really want to compare them, I need to know the features to do a good comparison. But for the most part, they don't tell me that stuff up front because most consumers aren't interested. So one of the exercises that Agile Project Management suggests that we do, and we're not going to do it in here because I'm a little project, is creating a serial box. And I think this is a really cool concept. Um, well, I'm not an artist, so I would not be very successful at this. I will tell you I've got no ability to do this. But the idea of the serial box is what? Some of you might have heard me talk about this before. Why is the serial box interesting? What's on the front? I mean, it looks like a magazine cover at some level, right? But it's appealing, it's eye-catching, it's not a lot of data, but it's data that allows me to make good decisions quickly. So I take my kid to the grocery store, and he's really funny to take in and let him look at cereal boxes. Now he knows he likes Cheerios, he knows this. He knows that he does not like most other kinds of cereal because he's just a weird kid. Like, he thought Lucky Charms looked interesting. No, that did not happen. My husband, on the other hand, loves Lucky Charms, so we were lucky. But he has watched this movie called Hotel Transylvania, and he saw Count Chocula, is that a cereal? So he sees this cereal, and he's like, Mommy, I need to have that cereal. I will love that cereal. And I'm like, why will you love that cereal, son? He says, because it has got Dracula on it, and I love Dracula. But he dresses up like Dracula, and we were a little worried about him. Um, <laughs> but I was like, that's not a reason to buy the cereal. Like, let me tell you about the cereal. Let me tell you what it tastes like. No, no, I don't, I don't care, Mommy. I will love this cereal. He is certain he's going to love this cereal. We buy the cereal, the cereal is gone in the trash can because it went stale. Because he does not love the cereal, and apparently the husband does not like Count Chocula either. I don't know. 
Apparently Chuck's weird and dealt. Okay, I, I don't need it, I don't know. But, so on the front of the cereal box, that's where all decisions are made. You're going down the aisles. Anybody go to a grocery store where they turn the cereal box to the side? No, no, the way they stock it, where they turn the cereal box to the side. Why not? Because who wants to know what kind of carcinogenic properties are in your cereal? Right? Like, nobody wants to know that. We want to know that it's the tricks button. Right? And that it's got 100% of my US RDA of five vitamins and minerals, never mind that there are 4,000 that we need to be meeting. But that's what we want to know. No grocery store puts the information of the nutrients, which is on the side, in the cereal box aisles stacked up. And it sort of roosted for me uh, not too long ago, and actually really, really made me mad, quite frankly. Uh, so I was teaching a class on public records law with Carol Malazzi, one of our faculty members here, and we were trying to explain metadata. And metadata is an interesting thing to try to explain to non-IT people, because it's data about data, and that is the dumbest definition ever, right? Like, it just doesn't make sense. And so Kara takes a picture of a Hershey bar, or maybe Robin, Greg found a picture of the Hershey bar, I don't know. There's a picture of a Hershey bar on the front, and she's like, you know, this is the normal email, this is the normal data, this stuff on the front, that's what you see, it's the front of the cereal box, this is what is important to us. And then, she flips it over in the picture, or they flipped it over in the picture, and you see the, nutri the nutritional values. And what happened to me that made me so mad, is that I had bought stuff based on the sales pitch on the front, and I was sitting at my desk, literally sitting at my desk, and I had this thing called Kind Bar in front of me, and they're advertising buying in the organic section, they're advertising as being a healthy alternative to snacks, blah, 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 right? It's supposed to be great for you, all this stuff. And when I flipped over the nutri nutritional properties, I could have been eating a damn Hershey bar all this time. I had no idea. They were almost identical nutri nutritionally. Right? And so it was a really interesting experience because what they had done is exactly what I'm telling you to do. Sell on the front of the cereal box. Nobody cares about your details. Nobody cares about ones and zeros flying through the air. I know you do. It makes you feel good. I get it. But it doesn't actually matter. Police officers do not care how they get access in the cars. They only care that they have access in the cars and that the access never goes down for any reason ever for, you know, the rest of their lives. Our, our dean has multiples of every device, I think, is my understanding, so that he never, ever goes down because he doesn't care how it happens. He cares that it is always up and running. So we have to have a serial box. Then we create a not list. So let's talk a little bit about this not list because I think this is where we fail uh, fairly frequently. The not list is everything that we are not going to do as part of this project. Who does this? Sometimes we call it an out of scope document, right? The not list is really important. And it may look something like this. This is a, a good example of how to do it. What's the objective, right? In scope project objectives, out of scope project objectives. If something is argued between the department and the IT group or multiple departments, then you put it in the unresolved box. Who negotiates the unresolved box? The people paying for the project, right? The project sponsor, the person who is ultimately in charge of the project success or failure, and they can decide whether or not it needs to be in or out of the scope. But you have to be clear about what is not going to be done as part of the project. Now, I feel like I preach on this a lot, um, and who doesn't love Mr. Rogers? I am very sad my child will not have Mr. Rogers to grow up to at some level, but the bottom line is our project community is a lot larger than we typically think. We go, oh, okay, we've got a boss, right, like the department head, and they're here, and so we've got to talk to them, we've got IT over here, we've got to talk to them, and we're going to work together, and then there's all these other little people that probably don't matter because they probably don't care at the end of the day. Except, those people are the ones who will make or break your project all day long. Right? So you've got to manage your project community as big as you possibly can. Have people come over and meet with you. One of the things that they talk about in Agile Project Manager that I don't have a slide on is the information radiator. It reminds me of Back when I was in third grade, it was a very big honor to get
get to change the bulletin board for the week. You guys remember this? Like the corrugated paper that was stapled all around. And you got to change that. That was like the best thing that could ever happen. That means you were like a superstar student that week. It really was just some form of child labor. But ultimately, the teachers are working you and you know, they've got it figured out. So the information right here is the same concept. It's that coordinated paper bulletin board that tells people about what's going on. You can do it virtually, you can do it physically. It doesn't matter, right? It depends on your organization, what's going to work best for you. But that information radiator is really important because it allows people to have knowledge about the project and has a, has them a, they have a resource that they can feed into, and it can't be copious amounts of data, right? We don't care about that. We want to know, is it on time? Is it on budget? Are people satisfied with it? Customer stories. Nothing is better than customer stories on the information radiator. Right? I mean, that's really important. And I've been playing, I've, I've been playing a lot with Twitter when we were talking about this earlier. And I've been really interested in the way that certain companies are managing Twitter. So I ate a protein bar yesterday that was brand new out on the market within the last couple of weeks. And no, it's got better nutritional properties than our Hershey bar. I promise. And I tweeted about it. I took a picture of it. And I wrote, new fave protein bar, amazing. And then I did hashtag quest bar just to see what would happen, right? I had no idea if the company was on Twitter because I didn't bother to look for them. I had no idea if that was the right hashtag to use, didn't care, just wanted to see what happened. Within six hours, they had favorited my tweet and had replied to my tweet on their Twitter account. Those customer stories matter a lot. And we've got to learn how to use them the way that all these companies are using them on Twitter. It doesn't have to be anything huge. It just has to be Shannon saying that's an awesome protein bar, right? Because what they did by finding my tweet and then retweeting and favoring it is what? It validated their product, but more importantly it said, hey, I care about you, my consumer, the person that just spent their hard earned dollars on whatever it is. Right? So we've got to go out there and find those customer stories. People love to see their names associated with positive feedback. It's really important, so we need to do more of that. Okay, from an organizational context, um, this is just sort of a framework of what typically is going on. We've got whatever our project is, whatever our application is. We've got the business units that are working on it. We've got the IT units that are working on it. And then there's always these external units that are going to be involved. We like to call them politicians. <laughs> Right? And I don't mean big P politicians, they can be small P politicians. Brokers and other places that are impacting our ability to be successful. So, after we go through that process and we've met our neighbors and we've got everything kind of figured out, then we need to map out our terrain. And this is what you guys are really good at. This is your classic IT design. You say what's inside the scope, you say what's outside the scope, um, and you, you're pretty clear about that. And then you design, these are our existing systems. We are not going to replace the legacy mainframe. We're not replacing the way we do operation support or whatever it is. You're clear about that. And then you bring in, what are we going to spend our time on? This is what the application looks like. This is the database we're going to build. These are our users. This is our external system that we're going to provision. You've probably designed stuff like this your whole life, but I bet you don't put the out of scope in there as well. Why would you do that? Who cares about this? None of your users. IT cares about this. And the owners of those components really care about this. So they have to feel at some level like you are not coming in and completely wrecking their world, right? So it's one of the ways that we talk about sort of designing the, the terrain. Then we write, lay out the, the blueprint. And the blueprint is interesting because this is where you get to say whether or not we can do this. We've done a lot of work up to now. And we may pull the plug on the project. Who's done this before? Pull the plug on a project because you just didn't have the capacity. I think that is one of the bravest things you can do. I realize that it means that you may lose your job, right? I wish I tell elected officials and managers all the time, if you really want to do brave things, get rid of bad projects, right? Just stop spending millions of dollars keeping crap running because you invested in it $100,000 15 years ago. That's insane, but we do it anyway. But, so we've got to design this blueprint. And as we're doing it, we need to be clear about what we're looking for. So you've got a customer. They've got some sort of interface. What is it going to look like? This is what you do all day long. You're very comfortable with this design. I've seen you just requiring uh, documents. That's exactly what it looks like, 
right? There's a group of them too. They look just like this. You do this one at home. Can you tell me how many people all of this stuff takes from an IT standpoint? Probably. You can probably spec out what your team needs to look like. And there will be a document I'll show you. I think I've got it still in here. That will say, hey, okay, what about this? Does this look right? Because if you're really clear about the steps that need to be taken, you can specify how many people are needed to do those steps. I had this conversation yesterday around our ERP. I said the bottom line is, in order to do what you're talking about, I don't think one person can do it. That's insane to redesign an entire system and create a completely new, unique identifier that then somehow we're gonna have to migrate all that data. Like it's gonna be a disaster, right? Just outsource it. Find somebody else, pay them a lot of money, and just take the headache. If that's what we care about, gonna have to pay for it. <coughs> now, we need to ask what's going to keep us up at night. What are the things that may or may not get done that are freaking us out? So what are those things that you know in the back of your head that are existing that nobody's talking about this? It's typically called risk assessment. We do an exercise in class um, that we find to be quite useful, which is the project obituary exercise. Some of you remember this? Yeah, great, I did it this year, right? And what you do is you take an old project and they read a newspaper article on the old project and then they write an obituary, which is fun for them, on why the project died, and then they write a list of vaccines. Well, we've done it in other cases where you actually do it with the live project. You bring the team together and you have them write the obituary in a fun way because they will have to identify all the potential ailments that could kill the project. And then when they create the vaccines list, even though it's fun and it's hemispheric alternation, which is also important, they will come up with a list of risk management tools. So it's a really interesting way to get everybody on board to talk about the things that keep you up at night that can be at some level controlled. Not all of them can be, but some of them. We've got to ask really hard questions. Why do we ask hard questions at the beginning? When do you have money? At the beginning of your project, right? If you ask those hard questions after you've gone down the entire path, then you're not going to be able to get the fixes that you need put in place. I'm trying to think of what system we were talking about the other day that had this issue where you know, it was one of those things where I felt like we were just trying to solve an imaginary problem by throwing IT at it without actually understanding what the issue was. Was this in your class, Ira? I cannot remember this conversation that I had. Maybe it was in the K-12 class. Maybe it was a complete dream that I had because I dream about this stuff at times, which is a problem. But it was a really interesting dream to go with that, right? That said, they were trying to apply a technology solution to a problem that didn't really even exist. In some ways, it's kind of like what you were talking about um, with you know, thinking that you had one problem you were trying to solve and it wasn't actually the problem. So it was, you've got to ask those tough questions. I, I talk about this all the time at the gym that I work out at because the, the owner is just not understanding how to grow this business. And I keep saying to them, well, what do you actually want to accomplish? Well, I want to grow my business. Okay, why? Well, because I want to buy a bigger space. Okay, then tell me how many people you need per month to be members, and then we can create a strategy. Well, I don't know. Well, what are your margins? Well, I don't know. How are you still in business? Is what I want to say. I'm like, what? can I buy your business? Because I can make it successful. <laughs> but it's a really difficult conversation to have after you've already gone in full force and you've spent all your money. He has no money to do marketing. He has no money to do anything because he's already spent it all. And he does things like buy equipment, right? And I'm like, that's great. And equipment's important. But you're running out of capacity for the equipment in terms of space in the gym. So you're at a, a net loss right now. You can't grow your business because you don't have enough members can't get your equipment into a bigger location, you can't buy more equipment, you spend all your money, so now what do you do? Right? It's a really difficult place to be. So we've got to ask those tough questions up front so that we can actually get the targets when we get to the end. Okay, how do you identify this? You go through and you talk about high level risks. What could go wrong, right? This is classic risk analysis. Is there anything that we can do about it? If so, great. You do whatever you gotta do, you do prototypes. If you can't, you move on. We don't get hung up on stuff. And this is, um, you're talking about one of our colleagues down in Wilmington who kind of gets stuck in spins. Ray Hillen, who's going to be speaking tomorrow at the, the Sieges session, he has that same problem. And there are security people. Anyone here is a security person? Nobody? Oh, well, good. We can talk about security people then. So, so, I'm just kidding. 
Security people tend to get micro-focused on something and they can't let it go. They see every possible combination of what could go wrong versus the 95 ways that it could go right, right? And so, what, how many of you have had children? This is easier than security. If you've had a child, what did your mind do 90% of the time? Did, did it think about all the things that could go wrong, right? For moms, almost always. For dads, not so much. You don't really think about it. And my husband and I had a huge fight about this because it really pissed me off and he didn't validate the way that I was stressing out about things all the time, like everything, like listeria, you name it, it, it stressed me out. And, and he said, look, I watched a, a show one time. He said, I wish I could find it. It's called like, The Beauty of Life or some, I don't know, some life show. And he said, and it talked about the 100,000 plus things that have to go right. And how most of the time they go right. Now, there's always an exception, a horrible exception to that rule. He said, but it, was, it really made me stop thinking about the worst about things and more about the best about things. Well, security people seem to do the same thing. They get stuck in this issue of a cloud control nap or whatever it is. I don't know if you guys have brought to the list server. There's this whole discussion about cloud control naps. And it has been exhausting. Was it a nap or a nap? The wireless controller, yeah. I mean, there's like this whole drawn out thing. Everybody kept saying, let it go, it's fine, it's fine. And finally, I sent to the SBI and they sent a minute back and said, dude, chill, it's okay, right? But security people don't want to hear, dude, chill, it's okay. So we have, to, we have to make sure that we can force them to move on at some level. I think that this, which is, <laughs> maybe we all need this every day, all day long. But for projects, we certainly need this. There are some things that we are not going to be able to change. If we can change it, great. If we can't change it, let us hope that we know the wisdom that we're not able to change it and just push on. Okay. Then you want to do what's called sizing up the project. And so when we're figuring out the size of the project, this is really the scale and scope discussion. If it is a big project, you've got to give yourself enough time to get it done. I think one of the most dangerous things that we have seen in the last 15 years, probably, is this artificial deadline setting. I'm forcing us to hit deadlines and then they change them. But separate discussion, right? But forcing us to hit deadlines because the manager, the elected officials, whatever, have a project that they want completed before they retire, before they move on, before they're trying to go to re-election. So these artificial, artificial deadline cycles, it used to be Y2K that drove that artificial deadline cycle, all the people perceive that as a real threat. Now it's truly a false threat. So what you're doing while you're going around talking about this project to determine how it actually is going to roll out and how much time it's going to take is you gather stories. You ride along with police officers. You go on the garbage truck. You find out enough about your customers to see the way that they're doing their work. You also, while you're doing that, are gathering stories about the capacity they have. And I don't know that we do this enough. You guys complain that your users do not do user acceptance testing. Right? Is that the bane of your existence? It's their project. They should test it. Right? That's a fair complaint. Except that they're just as busy as you are. And so when I was in uh, Greenville, North Carolina, they rolled out, well, I'm trying to story that I'm going to try to shorten. Greenville had done an RFP for a new public safety software system. Anybody here from Greenville? Nobody was working on that project at the time at all. But I would have, there was John and uh, I don't remember what thing. But anyway, when they had done this new public safety project, and they rolled out the RFP. They had everybody on board, law enforcement, you know, everybody involved in public safety, EMS, fire, police. They all did the testing. They had users that did the testing. Everything was perfect, right? They picked a software. They had an interim chief that was serving, and then the new chief came in. And the new chief came from OSSI, and they had picked New World. Okay. You never pick software for public safety when there's not the chief in place. That's like a cardinal rule that we learned from that project, right? So the new chief comes in, and he starts instantly saying, I'm not sure about this. Even though they'd already signed the contract, they hadn't started implementation. So he's holding them. Oh, well now, command and control organization, all the officers who had previously supported the decision did this and said, oh, IT picked this solution. <laughs> right? Doesn't matter what the documentation was. So I went back in, I didn't help them write 
daughter to be able to back in, and I sat down with the chief, William was his first name, I can't remember his last name. And so I sat down with him, and I talked to him, and I said, look, what's your concern? He says, well, I just don't know the system, I don't know the functionality, my officers tell me they didn't support it. And I said, no, no, I was involved in it, you've got to bring in a neutral party, because IT telling them didn't work, right? And so I said, I was involved, they all agreed, let's get everybody in the room, and you need, to, you need to be clear that you don't care what system they use. As long as it's a good system and it works, then that's great and we're going to move in that direction. And so he says, okay, well, I'll give that a shot. They all changed their tune because none of them wanted to make the chief mad, right? Which I understand. That, that's common sense. And so they, they all changed their tune. Well, then I really uh, got myself into it because we had not done a pro or they had not done a project charter and you should do a project charter for a project that size, right? And they had made an IT project for Rex and John Hodder. John Hunter is one of the nicest human beings you will ever meet, and he should never be a project manager because nice people should not do project management. That was the direct word. Just so you know. uh, I mean, you can be nice and not, but you've got to be forceful. And John is just one of those really, really sweet people that he was having a hard time forcing them to do what he needed them to do. And so we're sitting at a round table, and I had Deputy City Manager uh, Tom Moten, I had the City Manager Wayne Bowers, I had the Chief of Police, uh, William, whatever his last name was. I had the EMS director, whose name I can't remember, he had a broken foot. I had the fire chief, and then I had John and Rex, all in this big, huge conference room. And they said, okay, well, what's the next step? The chief says, he's okay with this. What do we need to do next? And we're still not making any progress. And I said, all right, first we're going to write a project charter, and the sponsors are going to be the chiefs and the director of EMS, and IT is not a sponsor. And by the way, city manager, you are ultimately the sponsor of the project, right? Because you have got the ownership of this. And so they all go around and they sign it, and they had decided to have it. The way that we worked it out is they needed a project manager that was not in any department. They needed one that was outside of the departments to be able to implement. So they brought in a project manager to report directly to the deputy uh, county manager or city manager, and that worked great. And then the last kicker, and why I've never been invited back to Greenville, I'm certain is that I said to them, all right, deputy manager, manager, you want this project to roll out? Yes. One of the most important facets of this is the officers and, and the line staff, that are public safety staff, have got to be able to implement and test and do what they need to do, and they're already working at capacity. So you've got to find out how to bring in temps or offload some of their workload to someone else so they can do what's needed because they've already identified 25 people that have to do this work, otherwise this project is going to fail. And I, I that. But that's the only way for it to work. And it was the right way to do it. They had, you've got to take some capacity off of people if they're working at full capacity if you expect them to do testing. <laughs> and this is where you have some examples of what kind of uh, priorities you have for project staffing. And this is just one that came from a project where there was one project manager with agile development or agile project management expertise and also expertise in the business area, how many developers you might need, how many analysts you might need, what, how many customers you need involved, and then what about QA? So this is just sort of an example of what you would spec out. Finally, we want to go through and decide who is going to actually call the shots. Because whoever is the ultimate point person has got to be willing to make hard decisions. Decisions that they would want made to them if they were on the receiving end, right? So we come back to that golden rule, but we've got to specify that one person is calling the shots and that there is a management structure. And the reason the gold bar is there is because whoever's got the money has got the management structure. Whoever's paying for it is ultimately the decider, right? It can't be management by committee. It does not work ever for any reason. One of the things that I really like about Agile, and we're coming up towards the end, is this idea of trade-off sliders. And we've seen this work in a couple of different places, and basically what you do, there's some tools that you can use online to create this, but you spec out what are the high-level goals of the project. And you have the various project sponsors and project participants decide which of these are most important to them. And I love how you have Yes, that is an IT person's response, <laughs> right? I'm just kidding. But I mean, I think it's interesting. So you can't have all of them be on or all of them be off, right? Because we know that in the capacity we won't allow us to do that. So what is going to be the balance of where we spend our time? You've got to figure that out for your own organization. 
I would probably do this with maybe a liquor scale or something so that you could actually force people, maybe a force distribution where you have to add up to 100% or something along those lines. Because I do more that you could gain this a little bit, right? If you got with your buddy and you take the opposite end and neutralize your scores, maybe people don't think as deviously as I do, but that's what I would do. So you have this trade off slider. But the reason you have this is because the decision by the committee, in this case, is really important. They're going to feed up information. Think about IT governance. Same concept. We're going to feed up information about prioritization of projects. Ultimately, the big boss is paying for it all can wrap whatever we say, but usually they don't. Right? Usually they will listen to the committee. Then you do your project estimates in terms of when you're going to roll out your various uh, releases. By the way, in Agile, you're doing releases, constant releases and iterations. After you've done that, you decide if it's a go or no go. So again, you think about how much time we've already invested, how many dollars we've already invested, and then we might decide not to do it. But that's okay, because you're not going to waste as much money as you would waste if you did it and it failed miserably. So you decide how long it's going to take. Stakeholder time is key. I think we as IT professionals completely ignore the stakeholder requirements on their time. We just assume the testing is easy for them to do or that it fits into their life. And we do not give them any sort of recognition that they're just as busy as everybody else. And I think people complain about them not doing the testing. What we're saying to them is, well, your time's not as valuable as ours, so you should be doing it. All right? So we definitely have to be uh, a little bit more clear. Now, what do we do if we can't get the stakeholder time? We can't get them to say what the requirements are. What if we can't get them to commit their time? Absolutely. You have to do that. I say every time, especially with the larger projects, that people have to relate their time to it. And if that means overtime needs to be budgeted or that right. bill needs to be done, then you have to do it. And if you don't, I've got some projects I can point fingers to in our community that were very visible failures. Mm -hmm. And one of the major underlying reasons is is nobody was on that project full time from the state. And you told them that they had to be. So ultimately, it's, it's like an HR issue, right? Like HR issues are not solved by IT fixes, like blocking Facebook or whatever. It's the manager that has to solve the HR issue. Same concept. If the manager doesn't do what they have to do, then ultimately the failure's on them. And I know that doesn't make y'all feel any better because you still feel like the failure's on you and people blame you. But you've got to set those expectations. You have to let them know what is the commitment. What are the ways that we're going to structure you know, the, the discussions that we have? Demand their involvement, document their involvement, be flexible, and then recognize that sometimes you're going to need time to, to shift around and do other things. So you have to iterate around what your deliverables are. But it's certainly really important to have that stakeholder involvement and have documentation that says. Mark? I was going to say that to you. The documentation can do. Put that in the documentation. Even if it's in just email or something, there's also explain the risk because participation when we've done it verbally in the past has been very low, but once you integrate that documentation that explains to them what the issues are, they become more uh, to participate. What I've been telling the city county managers class or uh, the municipal county administration classes, whichever classes I'm teaching in, is that if you really want people to start using the systems you're investing in, start making part of the performance evaluation. The use of not the proper use of it, just the fact that they're using it, right? Because the only way, what gets measured gets done. Say it a million times, and it's always the same case, right? So if you want people to adopt a new system, you have to incentivize them in some way, shape, or form, which is performance evaluations, right? You've got to give them time and reduce the fear that if they try the new system and it takes them longer, that they will be penalized for that. It's not, it's not evil to tell them it's okay to take longer. Do you have something? Um, I've actually got other department heads that are lost. I'm trying to start doing that. Like yes. We roll out stuff and says, awesome. you will do your work orders using this system. Yeah. And that's part of your goals and objectives. Absolutely. Yeah, because then they'll do it, right? I mean, they might fuss about it, they'll eventually do it. If my performance objectives are measured by me filling out that silly battle yeah. report, I assure you, I will fill out that battle report. <laughs> over and over and over again. Another thing that you can do 
coming behind. You know, we were expecting to do this this week, but we weren't able to do it because so and so was unavailable for testing because they had other work priorities. And when they see that, oh crap, that's my project. Right. This running behind, they're not aware of it because chances are, like you said, they're getting that person whose time you need is being evaluated on some other criteria from that same person. And if they realize that that's actually going on, they can step in and change those priorities and then you get that body that you need. But if you don't involve them or at least keep them informed, which goes back to what you were saying about knowing your neighbors and, mm -hmm. and all and the, um, what do you call it? Um, I don't remember. But, trying to bring the process into the group. Yes. What would you recommend? I would learn the theory behind it before you worry about the art mm -hmm. of it, of the application. I would learn the theory, not to mention that, I mean, I'm Shannon editorializing for two seconds. It looks good on the resume. Would you, would you do Scrum? Would you do the Scrum stuff? Or would you do I would do Scrum and Agile probably if you can. But I would definitely look at Agile. The skill solvers that we have here on campus has got the Agile training in it. So I would definitely look at that. Yeah, anybody that has skill soft through the state has got that job. It's very good training. Yeah, there's a ton. There's PMBOK, uh, all the PMBOK courses, um, CAPM, which is the Certified Associate Project Management. They've got Tom, CompTIA Project Plus and Agile all in that skill soft set. Yeah, it's 168 bucks. You can buy it through the states for cheap. That's free. And that's, I'm not talking, you don't get the certs from them, you get the training from them, you have to do the certs. Elsewhere, but that's a, that's like a tenth, no, a, a one hundred of the entire list of services. But there's like what, thirty five hundred courses. Yeah. I love. It. I think it's quite useful. I mean, for cost, we probably yeah. we decide that's our Awesome. All right, I believe we are breaking for lunch. Is that right, Jason? Yes. So lunch is right here in the hallway. Hopefully, have it up there. I'm sure they will. Out there. 